Hello, my name is Dr. Dave Skippers, and I work with uh, Walsh College in the Information Technology Decision Sciences Department. I am a chair at Walsh College, and I am also a professor who teaches cybersecurity and automotive cybersecurity. I have been asked to work with you today in this, I'll say, in this uh, webinar to talk about new and emerging threats. Um, in particular, we're going to focus on what has COVID-19 done to the cybersecurity landscape or ecosystem and the impacts that have happened. If you are unaware of these, um, you know, we'll go through those uh, and, and we'll hopefully get you up to speed quickly. So first up, um, I am known for sarcastic memes. So I'll say maybe take those with a grain of salt as you see them. Um, we will do a mix of serious and, and, and I'll say sarcastic memes. Um, but the agenda for today's uh, session will be, we're going to first do definitions. We want to make sure that business and technical people are on the same page when we talk about concepts. Uh, we're going to talk about the fog of COVID-19. So it might be a term you're not familiar with. We will go through that. We're going to then get into, with the landscape set, we'll then move into emerging threats for 2020. And of course, after we do that, we prefer to give you some strategies and tactics to try to address those going forward. So hopefully that will be helpful. Now, let's talk about the cyber kill chain. So the cyber kill chain is this concept that, or process in essence, that uh, Lockheed Martin came up with that attackers use to compromise our security. So we have a security model where we have infrastructure, we have barriers, and there's assumed zones of trust and assets and devices. For instance, once somebody's logged in, we assume that they are, that device is now trustable and they have validated that they are a trusted user. Um, the cyber kill chain or, or cyber attackers, I should say, seek to exploit that by actually doing recon, so gathering information on processes, people's devices, et cetera, um, maybe systems, and then I try to use that to weaponize it. So how do I take that information and actually use it as a weapon against you? So hence weaponization. I then move into delivering an exploit. We'll keep it simple and say, I send you a phishing email that tries to get you to open up a download. When you do that, it exploits your machine. It installs uh, malicious software for me. I then begin trying to act on my objectives. The process here that everybody needs to understand and comprehend is that we start off external. My, in, my whole goal as an attacker is to gain a foothold within your trusted areas so that I can exploit them and pivot and gain more access. So what do I mean by pivoting? So let's talk about that briefly. So pivoting means basically moving farther up the ecosystem. So in essence, once I gain access on a laptop, let's say I, I compromise your laptop with a phishing email, once I'm in your trusted infrastructure, I'm now gonna to continue to try to move through that infrastructure and gain additional access. So I want admin access, I want unrestricted access to different areas. Ultimately, I want the domain, so what controls your entire infrastructure. I want full admin credentials on that, so I own your domain and I can do whatever I want. This is what they're after. This is what pivoting means. Um, we need to understand that just because somebody sends me, um, me being you or any of your, I'll say any of your um, compatriots, if you will, within your organization, just because you get the phishing email doesn't mean that you're the ultimate target. You're just a step in the process. So they are in essence trying to gamify um, and level up within your organization. So this is very much a both a, I'll say we're using the term gamification, but it's also pivoting um, to gain additional access for achieving my ultimate goals. Now, we've just talked about how is the traditional security model exploited. That's what we just covered. Now we're gonna talk about zero trust. So Forrester came up with this concept. It's been out for a bit, and this is really that Despite having infrastructure and firewalls and all these other things, there is still no safe zones. We have to start thinking differently, philosophically. We have to comprehend that the enemy will be within the gates. Um, traditionally, security is assumed there is a wall that we keep them out of that wall, outside of that wall, and then we're safe. Um, this model very much assumes they will breach that wall. And then we have no trusted use users and we have no trusted assets. So with that, I add additional, I'll say automated actions and, and detection processes that will try to determine malicious, uh, malicious actions despite the source of them, all right? So nobody is exempt from that. So this philosophical model really shifts from, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to defend the entire attack surface um, and all of my infrastructure, and we start to prioritize. 
what is the most important asset or system or operational ability that we need in order to function as an organization. I'm going to dedicate critical assets and in, in approaches to maintaining that. So if I do lose some of my infrastructure, I do not lose the most critical pieces of that. Um, so this moves us from a protect all to a cyber resilient um, approach. It is very much built to combat the kill chain. Um, so we want to go back and actually address that and stop these people at every step along the way. Zero Trust builds in mechanisms to do that and philosophically shifts our attention and our focus in a different manner. Now, additionally with that, and we just talked about what are your most critical systems, right, that you have to defend. So response plans, and I'll say according to IBM, um, about 75% uh, of organizations do not have a business continuity or disaster recovery plan. So pretty scary, not good. Um, you know, if you're in that, if, if you're in that particular category, um, I would recommend, you know, I'll say saddling up and, and getting on these as soon as you can. Um, so business continuity, let's just kind of distinguish the two. Business continuity is focused on maintaining the ability to function as an organization, hence business continuity, under duress. So we may have adverse events, we may have cyber attacks, I mean, COVID-19, et cetera. We wanna be able to continue to function as an organization. Um, business continuity is, we are not in a normal status. We are in a, um, under a, I'll say, non-normal situation. We are under duress as an organization and we're trying to maintain our ability to function. We are, although it may be impeded. Um, disaster recovery means we have fully lost our ability to function and we must restore that ability. So it's a very good distinction between the two. These two play together. So for instance, if I lose all functions, I bypass business continuity and I move right to disaster recovery, hence the name recovery. So we've had a disaster, we wanna recover from that. Once I bring some of my business operations back online or critical systems, I move back into a continuity plan. So I want to maintain those systems and keep them functional while I continue to try to bring on the other, I'll say varying degrees of non-essential systems so that we can go back into a normal state. These two plans are designed very specifically to make sure that you as an organization have pre-scripted your actions and decisions for the most part in order to reduce the number of decisions you have to make under a stressful event. Um, this is critical, this is critical to success. Ad hoc decision-making under duress does not typically go well. So with that said, what do I mean by that? Let's talk about that concept. That concept is often known as the fog of war. The fog of war is typically a, I'll say a business, uh, or not a business, I'm sorry, a military term. It typically means the fog of war is the condition that most human beings enter into during combat. So during combat in life and death situations, things happen. Our cognitive ability diminishes, that's typical. Um, some human beings fully lock up and they can't function whatsoever. Um, within these situations, there are some commonalities that always occur. Number one, the heightened stress creates confusion. Um, two, we often want to demand more information before we act. This is typical of human beings in these situations. We often also, based off the nature of the events, we often get incomplete or inaccurate information, which compounds the issue because we are in a rush and we are not paying attention to accuracy. Um, which then creates frustration and adds to the heightened stress, which all of these factors together then create a loss of focus. So we have a very hard time focusing on what we're actually supposed to be doing and focusing on. Now, with that said, these are the particular reasons why business continuity and disaster recovery planning are important. It helps reduce the impact of the fog of war. Now, let's talk about the fog of war. Well, and I'll say, how does this apply to cyber? Some people might say, if you've ever been under a critical um, cyber attack from an, I'll say a nation state or an outside organization, you understand how, how, I'll say, how nasty and sustained this can be, and it will bring with it the fog of war. So you actually have to be able to mitigate this and address this appropriately. Now, with um, the fog of war discussed, let's talk about the fog of COVID-19. So in essence, we know 
Um, regardless of, I'll say, everybody's perspectives here, we know a couple of things. One, um, we have shifted to remote organizational operations. Many, especially large scale organizations, have workforces working from home. There has been, with supply chain disruptions, we know that there has been an increased online commerce amount as well as financial business being done there. This is also within the business and consumer arenas. So we've shifted from a, you know, we've always been shifting to online commerce, but in essence, we've shifted even more into that with brick and mortar being impeded. Um, there has been a disruption of communication. Everybody's thirsting for information. There's a lot of, we've seen updated figures, we've seen updated information, sometimes appearing to be contradictive. This is all typical of the fog of war. You're not getting accurate information just because people are confused and under duress. This has obviously created a lot of uncertainty and confusion. Um, I'll say anxiety and fear has amped up culturally for us. We know that. Um, I would argue that the fog of COVID-19 has literally thrust the vast majority of the United States, if not the globe, into the fog of war. Um, so these are this is what I mean by the fog of COVID-19. Structurally and operationally, it has impeded a lot of organizations. So how do we know that? We're going to get into that in the emerging threats. So this particular section, we're going to now start to dig in. So first up, at a high level, we're going to talk about the public's interest in public's interest for pandemic information. We're going to get into how has that moved into vulnerabilities. Um, for the attackers, what, what does that mean for ad hoc decision making, as well as we know that it's been successful and there's been shifts based off of the examples we're going to provide and we'll cover a new target that uh, has definitely come about because of COVID-19. So the public is thirsting for information. What do I do to protect my health, my family, et cetera? I get it. We're all in the same boat here. We're trying to make it through this unscathed. I get that. The problem is um, the cyber attackers and advanced persistence threats out there, nation states know that there is a thirst for information. If as an organization or as an individual, you do not communicate regularly and effectively, they are going to explo exploit that inability. Um, and they are going to send out things like this phishing email that you see on the screen. This is to drive people. It, it's obviously an impersonation. It's saying it's from the World Health Organization. If you look at the WHO, we, we don't have the actual direct there, but it's at who-pc.com. So obviously it's not from who, um, from the World Health Organization. It would have a very different um, domain name there. So we have seen a massive uptick. In some reports, I'm seeing 400, 1,000, 6,000%. It's across the board. The short answer here is we have seen massive increases. Um, we know that, that it has very particularly focused on phishing emails. This has been used to exploit a number of, it's not just the US, this is happening globally, typically associated with the topic of COVID-19. They want to impersonate a trusted source, such as a government agency, um, or even potentially your organization itself. Um, so these are all ways that they're leveraging the public's interest in the pandemic. So we know there's an interest. They're now saying, hey, if there's an interest and people are confused and there's the fog of COVID-19, let's exploit it for our gain. And that's what they do. So we need to understand this. None of this is surprising. I'll say based off what we've seen historically, this is pretty much by the numbers. Um, another emerging threat is we're gonna, they're gonna leverage the increased vulnerability. So what does that mean? Um, so in essence, we have a, as we mentioned that the workforce has shifted from um, brick and mortar on site to remote. With that, you are now, even if you're using VPNs, you now have endpoints on additional networks. Um, are those, are the security patches across all of those devices actually completed? Or are there existing vulnerabilities? When that's within your infrastructure as an organization, you can control that. When it's outside of it, you can't. Um, so there's additional problems with that. You now have remote nodes added into your zone of trust. Um, again, so there's a touch on the zero trust. So they know I can compromise home equipment probably easier with a phishing email than um, I'll say corporate. So what we're seeing is a significant uptick in, in attempts to exploit that additional equipment. Now with that, um, you may also be, if you've had not deployed VPNs, um, so there might be a number of factors involved here. You may not have the bandwidth with your ISP to handle VPN traffic appropriately or with your, your equipment and firewalls, et cetera. So you've had to deploy additional equipment. You do not have pre-built configurations. Did you predefine decisions? You didn't, you're making ad hoc. And, and then the, the 
probability of a insecure configuration going into deployment is much higher. Hence, this is why business continuity plans and disaster recovery are important. They tell our security personnel what are the configuration expectations on equipment when we expand that usage. Um, so if you did not have that, if you did not have BCPs and DRPs prepared, you opened yourself up potentially for additional compromises, even beyond just um, unpatched equipment, just insecure configuration deployment. So this is another one. This is why ad hoc decision making under duress is not wise. Next up, um, so we talked, we're talking about exploiting the additional vulnerabilities, ad hoc decision making, potential problems. What does that mean? Um, you know, at the end of the day, we know there has been a shift from individual and small and medium sized business attacks. They have shift, shifted to major organizations and corporations and governments. Why do we know that? So we know, for example, Employees are, as I've said, working from home. I can now exploit their equipment to get into the major organization or business. Um, examples of compromises this year alone are Honda in June, Garmin in July. We have Twitter. Of course, there was the infamous Twitter compromise um, in July, and then we have Canon got hit in August. So the, this is a shift, and they're not, they're just brazen. They know that a lot of organizations are potentially ripe for the picking and they're going for it right now. So if you have traditionally been safe, if you don't have all of the components in place, you may have opened up yourself for additional attacks and compromise. Additionally, we're seeing new targets come into play. So for instance, um, they are going specifically after medical and research groups that are focusing on COVID-19. And these groups are obviously trying to combat the pandemic. Um, we applaud them for that, but unfortunately, it's also gained the attention of, I'll say, nation states, rogue actors, and cyber attackers that are after this information as well. And they're trying to leverage the distraction or focus on combating the pandemic for um, compromise. So this is, again, it should not be surprising. This has been part and parcel pretty much every time we've seen new emerging threats or new emerging options appear. Now, what are the primary attack types within this? So phishing emails, we've talked about that. Phishing emails are up big time. Ransomware is also continuing to be used heavily. Um, and then there's a new, I'll say there's a new wrinkle here. The new wrinkle is, so traditionally with ransomware, one of the defenses, if, if I back up and have good reliable backups frequently completed, I can just go to my backups and I don't have to pay the ransom. Um, they know that, so now what they're doing is, I, I stole your data, I locked it. If you don't pay me, I'm gonna sell your data anyway, and I'm also gonna email your customers that I have from your data, that you've been compromised. So in essence, it's it's a docsware is a polite way of saying it's blackmail. Um, Although, you know, we should be aware this is starting to appear and it's been happening. So uh, should definitely be part of your models and discussions for planning. So from Microsoft, what are the top five investments that were, that were happening at the beginning of the pandemic? Multi-factor authentication. So if you're not familiar with that, so like two-factor, I log in with a user ID and password and I have another token, maybe a text sent to my cell phone with a code that I then use to um, validate or authenticate myself. Um, should be should be in place. Um, obviously, if it wasn't, I, I would highly re recommend you move there if you don't have it. So endpoint detection um, or protection, I should say. Endpoint protection is very much about the ability to protect devices no matter where they're at. So this is moving protection from centralized to adding layers at endpoint. So this is very much trying to combat that issue of, I have laptops on home networks that are VPN, and do I have protection on that device itself in order to stop phishing attacks, et cetera. Um, and a phishing tools, obviously, for obvious reasons. We want to stop that. VPNs were deployed heavily, not surprising here. And last and certainly not least, end user security education. So if we educate our users on what is the proper source of official communication um, and what are phishing emails and how do they occur, we can actually help combat this significantly. So none of these, again, are surprising. They do align with what we're seeing as the emerging threats. So the real question here is, who has maintained high resiliency? So what key items or I'll say traits do organizations exemplify that have done well in COVID-19? So I would, I would characterize all three of these. So this is actually from a study from IBM. 
I, I totally concur with this based off my research and what I've seen historically. Um, I would I would earmark all three of these under mature processes. So if you remember last year during the, uh, I'll say the presentation that I did for the event in October for cybersecurity event, I talked about expand your, um, I'll say mature processes and institutionalize that throughout your organization. If you had done that, you should be in pretty good shape for COVID-19. Now, what does that mean? I organize and deploy assets or resources strategically. So I have um, basically goals and visions and strategies and tactics, and I align my organization and resources in line with that. I, you know, basically I spend, um, security money on things that further that vision goals strategies and tactics i communicate regularly so they know the communication sources everybody understands what happens if we do institute a disaster recovery or business continuity plan that is communicated the official sources are known and there is a high level of effective communication happening and then with that of course comes coordinated responses so this very much strategically st speaks to this concept of bcp and drp not everything is a bus business continuity event or disaster However, those plans do define that, and then those coordinated responses uh, means, coordinated means across multiple areas and utilizing multiple assets and personnel. So everybody understands the role that is communicated effectively, and we mobilize as a collective team. So these are the things that have differentiated those who've done well versus not. So what I would say is, you know, everybody should start to see a common theme here that we are seeing mature processes is critical to success. The technical capabilities are out there. Um, that's not the magic, I'll say that's not the secret recipe or magic formula here. Um, it is very much how you use that and how you operate effectively as an organization with mature processes. So hopefully I'll say that helps you in perspective. What I will say is those are, you can't build those in a week. Those things are dedicated to, they are, are focused on, and they are built over time. Um, so they take a while, but what they do is they enable massive benefits, especially in situations like COVID-19. That's where they shine and where your organization realizes the fruits of its efforts. All right, so with that said, um, we'll wrap up with a sarcastic meme, but also, if you have questions, um, I'll say you can reach out to me here. Here's my contact information. Uh, additionally, if you want help with any of the particular items within this, within this presentation on emerging threats and how to combat them, I know Riemann, ha Riemann has a great number of people that can help you and help consult and get your folks in line where they need to be. Um, please obviously feel free to reach out to them. If you have any questions for me, again, I, I'm more than willing to help and try to help make sure that organizations are set up and ready to be successful in these adverse events. With that, stay safe, stay secure, and stay healthy.